This week, protecting children from online harm. Is AI the answer? How does the PS5 compare to the Xbox Series X? And what does doing this do to my brain? Hey, welcome to Click. Hope you're doing okay. At the moment, we are all online much more than we used to be. I'm talking about us, the adults, but also our children too. And for many parents, there have been huge challenges trying to work from home at the same time as supervising children. And that has meant, in some cases, handing over devices before the proper parental controls are in place. And that's compounded by the fact that they may not have had enough time to supervise in the way that they would have done in an ideal world. So with my youngest, it's simple. I'm there, I operate the computer for her. I know that she's not gonna see anything that she shouldn't. But my son is starting to get to the age where I wanna give him a bit more independence, but I also wanna keep him absolutely safe. So. So what do I do? Can I rely on parental control software to block all harmful content? I feel that I also should be teaching him how to spot and, and possibly even become resilient to the stuff that he will still encounter online. Yep, that's a dilemma that all of us parents have to face. So we've been taking a look at some of the tech that aims to help, but also how companies and legislation could perhaps do more. <laughs> This is Sophie. She was just 13 when she took her own life. Like many parents, we'd given Sophie a phone and we gave her that at the age of 12. And we discovered a few months later that um, Sophie had been accessing really difficult um, material, really completely inappropriate for, well, in my view, anyone, but certainly a child of her age. Sophie had been suffering from depression and had had suicidal thoughts. Really hard bit for us was after Sophie had died and we interrogated her iPad, we found some really difficult imagery and some um, guides as to how Sophie could take her own life and what would be a, a suitable method for doing that. And that was really, really hard to see afterwards. It's very easy to blame the parents and say, well, what on earth were you doing giving your phone to you know, a 12 year old, giving a mobile phone? But actually we had parental controls at home and we had parental controls through the school. But these days, as you start to give a little bit more freedom to your teenagers, and as Sophie reached the age of 13, she started to get the bus with her older brother. The internet is ubiquitous. And I would question how much, how many parents know exactly what is going on on their 13, 14, 15 year olds mobile phone and what they've actually seen and what they haven't. Recently, a video of a young man taking his own life was posted on Facebook and subsequently spread to other platforms, including TikTok, where it took days to be removed. Just this week, Instagram announced that it'll extend the use of artificial intelligence to spot this type of content to its EU users. It can then make it less visible and in extreme cases, remove it. But this is a problem that exists across the industry. So I've been looking at Safe to Watch, a new AI video tracking platform that aims to help, which I've tested on an episode of the BBC's Harlots. So the software is set to detect sensitive imagery. And if it de detects it, then it will grey the image out, thus prevent it from being seen. Now it's currently an alpha, so it hasn't got its full functionality, but the general idea is that it can track video in real time. Now that could be something that's being streamed directly from a phone's camera or some video that's being streamed from the internet, but it can block any nudity or any violence that a child shouldn't be seeing before it ever reaches their device. This is all about semantic understanding, so the artificial intelligence isn't just looking at the image, it's basically contextualising everything around it, including audio. 
So Safe to Watch also can analyse, detect and prevent threats in cartoons and anime. It's picked it up. It's saying it's picked it up, but it's not hashing it. It's very early days for the tech. It is glitchy and full functionality is still being built, but its aims are big. It hopes to work across all content providers, including homemade video. We never let mum or dad see what the child is doing. That's crucial because we have to buy, if you like, and earn the trust of the child. Utterly, utterly important to the whole cyber safety process. Whilst the video tool is still being worked on, the company's AI-powered monitoring keyboard has been available since last year. Once you've downloaded SafeToNet keyboard app, you can select it as your default. Now, if I start to type something unpleasant, like, I hate you, for example, it comes up with a warning saying, watch out, high risk content. And you can tap on that warning for more information. Of course, it's pretty clear what I've written. It's just simply nasty. So let me try a few other things and show you how it would respond. So I feel depressed. And from there, it offers some advice. Oh no, would you like some advice? You're not alone, others do feel like you. We can all do simple things to try and protect children from harmful content. Most ISPs offer the facility to switch parental blocks on. That will stop some sites being visited. And most devices come with parental control settings that are easy to enable. But perhaps throwing tech solutions at tech problems isn't the answer. And we should be going back to basics. They're 11 years old, which is the you know, time again when they get their first device. How do we you know, use this in a way that keeps you safe, in the same way that getting on the bus keeps you safe, in the same way that doing anything? The first time you rode a bike and we took off those training wheels, we thought about when to take those off. So get them to think critically. Dr. Linda Papadopoulos is a psychologist working with Internet Matters, a non-profit organisation set up to help parents keep children safe online. She believes that giving kids the confidence to freely speak to their parents if they do experience a problem online is crucial. First thing is, what does it mean, you know, what does an appropriate mean? Secondly, even if you don't, you know, know if it's an appropriate, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, come to me. And thirdly, take a pause before you react. If you actually go onto a browser now and type in certain words into the bar at the top, the public browser at the top of your Facebook account, your Instagram account, you'll find the same Im imagery and the same live videos coming up today as you did back then. And Sophie died six years ago. And I think that says a lot about the control that these companies actually have on removing the t material. It's obviously not being removed quick enough to be able to, to stop harming our children. Ruth Moss there. With us now is Andy Burrows, who's the head of child safety online for the NSPCC. Andy, hi. Hello there. Uh, Ruth says that the tech companies haven't taken this material down anywhere near quickly enough. What do you think? Do you think tech companies are doing enough to stop this material from making its way onto children's computers and phones? We know that for many years, tech firms really haven't done enough to make sure that their services are, are fundamentally safe for children to use. We know that you know tech companies make design choices when they when they build products uh, about how to create really great immersive products, about how to keep us on services for as long as possible. What we really want to see the big uh, tech firms do is also then consider safety at the design stage, because it's those choices about whether you introduce a particular feature, whether you introduce it in a certain way, whether you use algorithms in a responsible way that isn't pushing out uh, uh, damaging self-harm and suicide content, for example. In your experience, what are the biggest online dangers for teens? Well, we are particularly concerned about the risk of online grooming that lots of children and young people face. So our research shows that one in 25 teenagers on some of the largest uh, uh, social networks have had a request to uh, to, to send sexual content uh, of themselves to an adult or they've received that content uh, from an adult. We know that the design features in how a lot of the social networks run really help to accentuate that risk. So think about, for example, uh, the algorithmically suggested friend suggestions that all of us get um, uh, 
on our accounts. We know that groomers can exploit those design features. Uh, li quite literally, every time they refresh a page, there'll be a, a fresh list of children who they can contact. And, and that's really analogous to the phishing emails that all of us get. The principle is contact large numbers of children in the expectation that a relatively small number may click that phone request. And then the process of, of grooming can begin. And it is difficult for the parents. Do you think the parents are getting enough of an education about how to deal with this? It is really hard for parents. And when you think about how quickly new apps and sites and games come from nowhere and then and then become ubiquitous, it can be really hard for, for parents to keep up. Children, uh, you know, unfortunately will be exposed to harmful and inappropriate content and, and potentially to harmful behaviour from others online. And if that happens, the most important thing to do is to sit and um, work through that with your child. To take away devices would not only be an overreaction, but it, it doesn't then help to make sure that your child is, is safer in future. Andy Burrows, thanks so much for your time. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that the EU charged Amazon with abusing its dominant position in the marketplace. Apple, at their fourth event of the year, showed off its new range of Mac computers, the first to be powered by Apple's own M1 chip. US retailer Walmart has decided to do away with its robot staff and replace them with actual people! Hooray! The roving robots had been keeping track of its stock in over 500 shops for the past three years. Virgin Hyperloop tested its first ever journey with passengers. The concept involves pods fitted within vacuum tubes, which, it's hoped, will transport people at very high speeds. The journey took 15 seconds, reaching over 100 miles an hour. Best not to get too excited though. The trial involved two company employees who traveled only 500 meters. And to end with, engineers at Disney Research have designed this robot, which can mimic human eye contact. The bot can turn to face people as they approach, and rather than staring into the depths of your soul, its eyes flit about in a more human way. Much less creepy. All it needs now is some skin and some hair. Welcome to Goodwood Speed Week, where hundreds of racing cars got to stretch their legs last month. Although not open to the public this year, millions of motorheads could join online to leer at some of the world's most valuable and historic motors. And then there's this, the Porsche Taycan Turbo S, £138,000 top speed 161 miles an hour 761 horsepower and as an electric car this should leave the field way behind now of course they're not going to let me drive this around the track on my own oh apparently they're going to let me drive this around the track on my own but only if i wear a couple of things while i'm doing it my brain waves were to be recorded using this headset and my stress levels recorded using this smartwatch. The idea behind both of these studies is to look at how our bodies behave during stressful tasks and then understand how best to mentally prepare for them. So, let's give me some stress. What I've got to do now is work out how to drive this thing. Here we go then. Oh my life, that's fast. Oh my gosh, I'm taking off again. That's way too far. You can't corner this fast, can you? I can. OK, so what is all this excitement doing to my brainwaves? Well, after the race, I hooked up with Dr Tony Steffert to look at my brain's beta waves, the main indicator of how my brain is coping with learning a new task. Uh, what might you expect the brainwaves of an amateur racing driver, or let's say a complete novice like me, to look like? Yeah, I would expect the novice driver to have more beta, more going on uh, and less able to focus on the narrow task of doing, of doing the driving. And then if you put uh, someone like Lewis Hamilton in that car? I would imagine he'd look like a meditator. You know, his, his brainwaves are all calm because he's kind of seen it all before and done it all before. 
I, however, hadn't, which is why on the complicated parts of the track, my beta waves went through the roof. And this is a chicane. This is a chicane I will slow down. Well, it's really slow for this. Oh, my life. That seems to fit that that spike, where the increase in beta okay. is going with the chicane. Holy mother of pearl. 80 seconds in, I put my foot down and go, uh, well, exclaim quite loudly that it's going quite fast. So what, what does it say at 80 seconds in on your, on well, your that's brain? that's funny well? because actually you're less beatery there. <laughs> well, that's because I'm on a straight maybe. Yes, and I was I'm... just about to say that, yeah. It's, you're not having to think quite as much. I mean, okay, you might be going, oh, oh my God, but you're not having to worry about corners and G-force and all that. 134. Oh, that'll do. OK, that's my brain done. Let's see if my stress levels from the smartwatch are telling us anything different. So we're in the second lap here, and at least according to the data, you seem to be chilling out a little bit and getting used to the vehicle. Your stress levels have been slowly declining through the first lap. Yeah. And then it gets really interesting. We can see a big spike coming, and it all seems to be around this moment as you enter the Levant corner. And it's great because you're really pushing the car as fast as you can manage and you're not sure if you're going to lose the back end. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Ben's software has been trained to spot stress through changes in blood oxygenation, breathing rate and heart rate variability. Now, it's not the same combination of changes for everyone and it's not the same in every type of situation. Here, in driving, it's the breathing rate, which is the main indicator of stress. And both Ben and Tony agree that if we can see for ourselves what affects our stress levels and our concentration, we can learn what activities get us in the right zone for a particular task. So if you can reduce the stress before you do a task, then you have more headroom to increase the uh, concentration during the task. If you're just on all the time, you're, you're consuming too much energy. You won't have as, as many reserves when you really need them. And just when I thought the worst bit was over, something unexpected in the data. And then what's really quite amusing is um, your stress levels are actually going to go back pretty much to the sort of high points. And it's actually all as you're coming off, off the track. It's not, not in the moment where you're kind of throwing the car around. It's, it's when uh, you turn on the indicators and try and figure out how to get back into, into the paddock and then everyone's shouting at you, giving you direction. So I'm, I'm more at peace when I'm hammering around the track at 100 odd miles an hour than I am trying to follow instructions about where to park. And That's it, maybe you're, you're more of a professional than you realise. Don't tell me that, don't tell me that, I'll be insufferable. <laughs> that was incredible, this thing flies. I wish I hadn't had such a heavy lunch. Oh, I love it that you find parking more stressful than speeding around a racetrack. Oh, no. But I also thought that it was really interesting that we need stress. Those ups and downs are actually good for us. Yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, Dr. Steffert said that before a task where you're going to need lots of brain power, it's good to give your brain some downtime. Otherwise, you won't have the extra capacity you need to get through the task. But what's also interesting is some people can go into a task not stimulated enough. And that means they make mistakes because they're just not paying enough attention. So true. We've all done that, I think. <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, Mark Chislak got his hands on the latest Xbox, the Series X. This week, he's playing with its rival, the PS5. So, how do they compare? There's no denying the new PlayStation is weird looking. Forget what the PS5 looks like just for a moment. We'll come back to that in a minute. Take a look at the games. Under the skin, the PS5 has a custom AMD Ryzen GPU, which supports ray tracing, a method of creating more realistic lighting effects. This means more visual whiz-bang for your buck. And it has an 825 gig SSD, which means load times should be drastically reduced. Whoa. It comes in two flavours, the full fat, full price version, which features an Ultra HD Blu-ray drive, and a cheaper digital only version, which lacks the optical drive. 
As well as ray tracing, the GPU is technically capable of 8K graphics, although for now, 4K is all we've seen. It should be able to pump out 120 frames per second visuals as well, although so far, everything that I've been playing has been at 60 frames, although very smooth. I've been testing this machine for a couple of weeks and I've mainly been playing Spider-Man Miles Morales and Astro's Playroom, which comes bundled free with the machine. Both titles demonstrate what the next generation is capable of, but in different ways. Spider-Man is simply gorgeous to look at, and the way in which Spidey traverses the Big Apple, web swinging, wall crawling, running and leaping from building to building, as well as taking out bad guys with his trademark athleticism, spider sense and web slingers are all great calling cards for Sony's new machine. Astro's Playroom casts the player as a cute little robot who embarks on a series of adventures inside the console. While some of these experiences are no doubt influenced by any number of platformers and adventure games, they do serve to showcase the PS5's new DualSense controller. So here I have to use my little robot to pull out this cable and I can feel the feedback and the elasticity of the cable through the controller. It feels weird to be impressed by that, but I really am. Something I'm less impressed with is the PlayStation 5's physical box. The PS5 has variously been described as looking like a router or an air conditioning unit, which is fair enough because it's one weird looking console, but I think all of its strange styling quirks are to try and mask its massive bulk. This is a big console. It's so big that it has its own postcode. In fact, I think it's so big, it's probably visible from the International Space Station. Houston, I can confirm. I can see the PlayStation 5 from space. Over. Of course, the biggest challenge the PS5 will face is not from its own massive dimensions, but from the Xbox Series X. Like the PS5, the Series X has better graphics and a super fast SSD, which drastically reduces loading times. It also comes in two versions, the Series X and the less powerful, cheaper Series S. One feature that sets it apart is the brilliant quick resume, which lets you switch between games in seconds, picking up where you left off. And perhaps the ace up Microsoft's sleeve for the Xbox is Game Pass, a Netflix-style subscription service which gives players access to hundreds of titles for a monthly price. We think Xbox Game Pass is uh, a critically important part of our platform. Uh, we are trying to make gaming more seamless, easier to try new games, easier to experiment with new games. It's really just offering a ton of choice to players right now. So, which of the two new next-gen machines to choose from? Well, they are actually pretty different. The PS5 at the moment feels like the most next-gen of the two. That's because the games that are available for it at the moment really do show off what this machine can do. The Xbox Series X, on the other hand, is the more powerful of the two machines here. And Game Pass really does open up a whole world of video games to people that don't want to spend as much money per month on titles. This is an evolution rather than a revolution, but on this evidence, it's off to a strong start. That was Mark, and that's it for this week. But just before we go, a word on something big that we're doing next week. Every year, the BBC's 100 Women Project shines a light on women's issues and women's achievements. And Click has arranged for some of the most inspiring female tech role models to be at a special event. And we would love you to be there too. So if you're a woman just setting out on your career in tech, get in touch. Tweet us at BBC Click and you could be in the audience and ask your questions to our special guests. Look forward to seeing you there. That's it for now, though. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.